Okay, welcome all to our Her Australia webinar. Uh, the key is to success leading with exercise best practice and exercise programs and also management perspectives. We're thrilled that yet again, we have more than 300 people all around the world joining us. We're really covering the whole globe from the North, um, um, what do you call it, the Arctic Circle to New Zealand and South Africa and all the countries in the middle. So it's a really, really nice group of people here. So good afternoon to Australia and Singapore. Good morning, Finland, and good day to all the other time zones we have present at the moment. In the spirit of reconciliation, Her Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connection to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. My name is Tore Karahari Husman. I am from Her Australia and I will be your MC today. Now, while our last webinar really focused on health and wellness during COVID and how you can um, stay healthy at home, today we really want to look further ahead um, and think we try to give you the best advice on how you should return to normality. I know South Australia is already there. Well done, you. Um, so we're really trying to give you the best advice on how to train properly and how to not just to exercise prescription programs, but also how to manage, how you innovate, how you create programs that work for everyone in both residential and community care and also retirement villages. So we've invited four speakers from different areas and they have decades of experience and we're so thrilled that they've joined us. And our, today our speakers will be first Jenny Hewitt, Dr. Jenny Hewitt from University of Sydney, talking about residential health, followed by Dr. Justin Keogh from uh, Bond University to talk about community health. And then Paul Johnson from Ballycara, who's going to talk about the business opportunity. And finally, Joel Boylan from Southern Cascade talking about service innovation. Before we move on, um, just a bit of the house rules. So just in case, well, you had a bit less time to read the slides. Apologies for that. It is the technical hitches happen all the time. I and mean, we didn't get to laugh about them and move on. So you had a few minutes to read, not sure if you made it. However, during the webinar, all your microphones will be muted and your videos disabled. Um, but the one, there's one important task for you. In the bottom of your screen, you will have the Q&A button. And that is your biggest role. So listen to our speakers and ask your questions. So all the speakers will have 15 minutes of speaking time, followed by five minutes of questions. It is not a large amount of time. However, type in your questions. We will answer what we can, but the rest we will type down. The speakers might be typing during the webinar, but also we can pass around the questions after, and they will have plenty of time to answer, and we'll post them then on the website. One important thing, there's a little thumbs up button. So if you can see a question that someone else has asked and you think that's an awesome question, please press the thumbs up button because then that means that there's many, not many people like that. So if we get 10 thumbs ups, that means that's a really hot question and we will make sure we'll answer that. Now, um, also if you hear this funky bell, I will show you what it is. It's just a little, Christmas bell. I know it's not Christmas, but the squeaky toy I had last time didn't work. So this little bell sound is for our speakers. If they have too much to say, I want to tell them to oopie, thumbs up. So that's just for them. So don't get scared about my Christmas bell. And also, so we really covering the whole globe and it's midnight somewhere. Um, so and some people might be working with their patients. So we will record this webinar. So at the end of the webinar, we will be posting on our website, um, the, all the slides, the recording of this, and also all the Q&As. So there's plenty of information in case you need to rush somewhere in the, at the moment. Now, it is time for the drum roll as we are about to present our first presenter. So Dr. Jenny Hewitt from Sydney University has a talk titled Exercise in Residential Care, Practical Tips on Success Factors from the Sunbeam Program and Beyond. Now, Jenny is a practicing physiotherapist and educator and also an academic researcher with many national and international awards. 
um, delivering best practice to her clients, but also really leading research that tries to inform the healthcare policy. So for example, the Sunbeam study she did has gone to all our politicians because she looked at 221 residential care residents with an average age of 87. And yet with her exercise program, they reduced force by 55%. And also in case you have been watching, the Royal Commission into Aged Care Quality and Safety. You would have seen Jenny a few weeks ago really talking about the allied health um, importance in, in residential aged care. So without further ado, please welcome Jenny Hewitt and Jenny you'll have your 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you Tura. I'll just bring up my, um, my PowerPoint slides to share. There we are in business. Thanks very much, um, Tura and uh, Her uh, Australia for inviting me to talk to you today. Um, I'm talking about the thing that's closest to my heart and that is residential aged care setting. Um, I think it's important for not to not just present the research, but to present the pr practical tips. So I'm hoping that that's what this talk will deliver and I really welcome any questions you might have as we go, go through. So the Sunbeam program that Tura was referring to um, started because about 10 years ago, I started working in residential aged care as a physiotherapist. I was really disillusioned with the, uh, the funding mechanism in Australia, which funds physiotherapists, exercise physiologists and occupational therapists and no other allied health, uh, and only to, to deliver TENS or uh, uh, other electrical agents or uh, massage therapy, when really there's so much more we could do. Things have changed a bit in the last few years, but that was the initial driver um, for this work that I'm presenting to you today. So I thought it was really important um, to have a look and see what evidence there was there to challenge and say, surely we could be funding other things as well as those things. Uh, and at that time, uh, which was around 2012, there just wasn't much evidence. So I had to make a choice then, either if I'm disillusioned with the system, either leave it or uh, stay in and try to do something useful to help um, improve the system. And so that led to a, cl a cluster randomised control trial, which I'll talk to you about in a minute. And then once the results came through, it was time to present the results to people who could make decisions about changing the policies. So exercise in residential aged care, back when I first started looking all of this, there, were, there was only one Cochrane review out initially, and that was the one in 2010. And when it comes to um, studies looking at the effects of exercise, particularly for falls, they were um, publishing that quote I've got written at the top, results relating to the effectiveness of exercise and reducing the rate of falls and the risk of falling are inconsistent. And what was most of the, uh, disturbing at that time was that this whole ripple effect. And so, if there are, is not good evidence for a particular type of treatment, then policymakers will often discard or abandon um, funding the particular intervention. Um, that's if they've looked at the evidence. So what, we really, what I really expected to find was that there was going to be evidence saying we should be exercising residents of aged care, and I couldn't find much, if any, and certainly not from the gold standard Cochrane Review. So we all know because we're in the business of exercise, but policymakers don't necessarily know this and they need to hear it from, from those of us who are working in the field. Exercise, one type of exercise does not equal the next type of exercise. In the same way as one type of medication does not answer for all kinds of medication. So I sometimes use the example, if a person had, was diagnosed with diabetes, would we give them a Panadol and then be surprised that, they're in, that their blood um, sugar levels didn't change. Of course not, because it wasn't the, the right medication. In the same way, just giving somebody any, any old kind of exercise is not necessarily going to have the right um, benefit for the person, but that doesn't mean all exercise is out. So I had to have a bit of a look more closely, and this I know this is an old study, but because this, is, this was the basis for the Sunbeam trial. The best evidence at the time I started all of this came from this Cochrane review, where they looked at supervised exercise versus usual care. There was only a few studies, as you can see, not a whole lot of work, but what happens in a Cochrane review, and it, and it is a very um, 
well-respected way of, of uh, judging the effectiveness of an intervention, what happens is they look at all the available studies on exercise versus usual care, and then they pool the results. So anything that falls, the results that fall to the left side of the line favours the interventions, the results that fall to the right side of the line favours usual care, and you pool it all together so that you end up with what is effectively one big study with a lot more statistical power. So you can see there's some helped, some didn't, and the net effect was that black diamond that says we don't know. And then I had a light bulb moment. <clears throat> we know that exercise type, dosage and frequency all matter. What if every study that they looked at there was using the wrong type and dose of exercise? So that meant that I had to look and see what was documented at that time as the best evidence, the best types of exercise for falls prevention. Um, this was published by Anne Tiedemann and Cathy Sherrington around about the time I was looking at all of this. It has been recently updated, but this was what we were working on. We, we could see it was a, a lot of exercise, 50 hours minimum, high level balance work, strength work for those who are deconditioned. Certainly residents of aged care tend to be deconditioned unless they live in some of the facilities we're about to talk about today. <laughs> but most, and certainly back at the time, that was the case. Uh, you have to in individually upgrade and progress exercises. So I was working in residential care and seeing lots of people basically sitting around in a circle, sometimes doing a DVD, sometimes doing exercises that have been prescribed um, by the activities team, but certainly not individually upgraded and progressed. And um, things like high, bal high level balance work were being omitted because of the risk associated. A lot of um, facilities at the time were taking the um, safe approach and just having everybody sitting. Um, at, it was acknowledged at that time that walking, while it might be beneficial for other things, was not considered a falls prevention program. And that makes sense too, I think. I thought I was guilty in the beginning of thinking surely any exercise is better than sitting in a chair, but this, um, this sort of woke me up to the reality. So I went back to those studies and found that none of them, not one, implemented the best practice, the key components of, um, of best practice falls prevention exercise. And hence the Sunbeam program was born. Um, it was a, a cluster randomised control trial. We had 16 residential aged care villages on the east coast of Australia. Eight of the, them were randomised to receive uh, the resistance and balance training program, the other eight got usual care, and we car carried on the program implementing those best practice um, guidelines that were available at the time. As Stuart has said, the mean age was about 87. Um, people had been in resident care for a couple of years as the median, but it ranged um, you know, even right up to 10 years for one of them, which, which is unusual in this day and age, but it was present then. There was a lot of fallers, more fallers actually, and more falls in the people that were randomised to the intervention group. Group. So if I was a betting woman, I would have put my money on that being a real problem for the trial. Um, but we just had to work with it. This is what the uh, intervention looked like. Are you seeing the video? Yes. So we used her equipment for the progressive resistance training part of the, um, of the program. And while people were able to um, and attend initially for an assessment where we checked their baseline, do you like the exercise boots, otherwise known as wetsuit booties? <laughs> but people were um, prescribed individually their own program, as you can see here. The smart cards put in, we've individually allocated resistance sets and repetitions, falling within two to three sets of 10 to 15 repetitions at a moderate, perceived moderate level. While people were sitting down doing the resistance, I could then run a separate group or the volunteers could run a separate group of high challenge balance exercises. So we could do these classes in groups of 10. I'll just give you a little note that the oldest person in this group is 101 and not once ever attended the exercise sessions until the cameras arrived. <laughs> But anyway, <laughs> I digress. <laughs> there was static balance, dynamic balance, reaching out of the base of support. And while this group's doing this work over on the other um, half of the room, people were doing their own individually um, prescribed progressive resistance training. It's another um, example of how that worked in a different facility. Apologies for the poor quality of this um, video. This one was done on my phone. But you can see we really, when we were talking high challenge balance, I did mean high challenge balance. So this is the grapevine, which is a challenge, of course, to cognition as well as motor control. <laughs> and again. 
See, high challenge balance exercise is not for the faint hearted. <laughs> and the results. So as Jura alluded to, we had a really fabulous result. After 12 months, we found a 55% reduction in the falls rate for the people who conducted the Sunbeam trial, um, the Sunbeam exercise program. That's an incident rate ratio of 0.45 and we're 95% confident because the confidence intervals don't cross zero, we're 95% confidence that it was the exercise program that made the difference. There was also a statistically significant improvement in physical performance, which was measured using the short physical performance battery. And excite most exciting to me was that there was no adverse events given the age and frailty of the, of the um, clients that, or the participants. So the take home messages are here. Um, this was group sessions 10 per class. The staff to resident ratio was one to five and we could do that because the smart card system allows each person to have their own exercises individually pre um, prescribed and upgraded and recorded. Um, and so we didn't have to have a whole lot of people there adjusting weights and pins and plates and so on. We did two one hour classes a week for 25 weeks. That's the dosage, two to three sets of 10 to 15 reps. And that's the equipment we used. Um, all of in exercises were individually upgraded and progressed by the physio attending once a fortnight and doing that for everybody for the first six months of the program. And after that, people just stayed on a maintenance program. We had to look at the cost effectiveness as well if we really wanted to make policy makers listen. And so a cost effectiveness analysis was performed and we found it cost $463 to, per person to deliver the program. And that included both the cost of purchasing the gym and the personnel costs. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that the initial setup costs, so you incur quite heavy costs perhaps in year one when you're purchasing the gym and setting it all up. But over time, because there's 10 year warranty on it, um, over time, those costs are filtered down. Um, the incremental cost effectiveness ratio was $22 per fall avoided. And the modelled saving to our health economy was 120 million. So it doesn't obviously then have to tell people about this, no point in doing it um, and publishing it, but then not actually taking it to the people who need, need to make the changes. So we did publish the RCT and the cost effectiveness paper and then shared the findings with that's the top photo is me talking um, to, with the health minister, uh, sorry, no, the um, Minister for Aged Care in the panel there. There were some stories on the news. Uh, it was disseminated um, abroad as well. And there was a bit of excitement initially when we discovered that the revised ACFI aged care funding was recommending that there was a new therapy program which also funded exercise as part of the therapies that were recommended. Uh, and this is a photo of me, no, not really, doing a cartwheel when I read it. However, this is how I landed. Uh, soon after there was a change of federal minister for aged care, uh, the focus went off the revised ACFI and onto a different uh, uh, recommended approach called RUPS, Resource Use Cl Classification Study. That's not too bad for us um, as allied health professionals because it does give us a bit more flexibility in terms of what we can prescribe. It's not, it's not sort of mandated for us. Um, but I was more interested in the Royal Commission into Aged Care because my learning from all of this is that you need to go, if you can, somewhere where people are um, out of the politics and it's just going to be the residents at the focus um, for the recommendations. And so I was really um, fortunate a couple of weeks ago to be able to talk to the commissioners um, about um, the recommendations for changing the way that um, allied health is funded in residential aged care and they've made a whole lot of really quite exciting recommendations which will be um, focusing on changes being implemented by July 2022. The other thing that's been a bit of a win is that now best practice, so Professor Stephen Lord is sort of well, well um, recognised internationally as the guru in falls prevention and he now um, gives gold bar evidence for what is recommended for falls prevention in residential aged care and physiotherapy based exercise um, has that one gold bar means that there's one good study to, um, to recommend that it is a worthwhile um, intervention. So here's your gold nuggets. <laughs> the muscle groups included in the Sunbeam program included knee flexors and extensors, hip extensors, abductors and adductors. We did tricep dips to help people getting up off the chair and flexors to balance that out. 
uh, shoulder retractors because of the posture, but we did that mostly in standing. So it became a balance exercise. Calf races also, that became a balance exercise. Things were done where people spoke about 12 to 14 out of 20 on the Borg scale. So we didn't do a one RM uh, because we were fearful of um, damaging people in the assessment process. So therefore we used that. If the gym's closed, uh, you can try and replicate it. This is some of my students doing hip abduction, adduction and a leg press using TheraBand. Or if people are at home and can't get into the gym, we haven't researched that, but that's how we've been, um, we've been trying to um, you know, uh, combat the fact that some of our gyms have been closed. The balance exercises were these. There was lots of standing work, heel raises, dynamic balance that you saw, static balance and reaching outside the base of support. Have you rung the bell, Ture? Yes, I have. I even forgot that. I didn't hear it. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right, to whip along then, balance with flair. Balance is boring, let's face it. People, um, my finding is that people seem to be happy to keep coming to the gym for as long as it's there, uh, but they get bored with those balance exercises. So the students and I have been working on a bit of uh, balance with personality, which has included boxing, Nerf guns, shooting at targets, here's dancing. Uh, the fellow in the middle there is standing on a foam pad in a parallel bars and we're playing beer pong. <laughs> Um, we've got a uh, football table there on the top right. You can see the fellow's gotten up out of his electric chair to do that. <laughs> so the, tr the trick, of course, is finding balance work that people are interested in doing. But we have been able to continue with the, um, the training equipment. That's my last slide. Um, I'd really, none of this work would have happened without the amazing support of this team of, um, of academic, uh, academics and friends <laughs> who uh, supervised me throughout. So. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you, Jenny, and you're spot on. Spot on in time, even if my, I tried to ring the bell like a man, but obviously it didn't come through. Now, That's all right. We had one question for you. Um, yes. And I have more in my mind, so let's see if I prompt others. Oh, no, there's two. Um, uh, question, just wondering how the one and a half, 1.2 hours a week was, for Oh, example, it was calculated? A week or how was it? Yes, it's kept that. So what we did when when we found that the, the falls prevention um, effect had, was 55%, we then went back through our attendance records to have a look and see how many hours did you actually have to attend to still um, get gain the benefit of a 55% reduction. So we offered 50 hours and if, pe if people um, attended 60% of that or more, they still got that 55% reduction in the risk of falling and the falls rate. So what we were then able to do is say we, you didn't really have to do two full hours, even though that's what we offered. Even if you did 72 minutes, <laughs> 1.2 hours, you still got that same effect. When it started to fall below that 60% attendance rate, uh, the, the um, benefit was less as well. Fantastic. Now we've got a thumbs up also, just people thanking you for oh. wonderful tips, which is wonderful. I think it's, it is so true because you, I, I love it how you put the, everything into practice and, and, and advising others. Now, I have a few questions. I'll see how many have time to answer. Okay. And I'm curious to see how did you measure the, play, uh, the baseline and what were your progressions and what was sort of the maximum increase you had with these people? So you mean the baseline for the first exercise? Yes, yeah, so if how, strength, how did you yeah. measure it and what was the... So we, we did have a printout of the bulk scale there um, not to 20, one to 20. Um, and we got people to, to sit on the, um, on each piece of equipment and try, uh, up to 15 repetitions. It is true. It took a bit of clinical experience to decide what weight to start with. Um, but we ended up making a generic program, which was quite easy. Um, and saving it on a card with the name Elvis. <laughs> and so Elvis was the, the first program and it was a reasonably easy low level for each person. And so they'd come into the gym, they'd start with a low level of resistance for each exercise for the first set, just so we could correct technique, tell them what, what it was about. Then we'd give them a rest and we'd get them to do another set based on how they performed at the first one by hitting the plus button and finding out how heavy we needed to make it before they got to that perceived moderate intensity on the Borg scale, then that became their starting weight for the next visit. 
So the first one was a bit of a, a, a hit and miss, trial and error, and then from the second visit on, um, they had their own individual weights. And after you got that, what was the, can you tell the progressions and how, what was the percentage? How much did they increase in strength about? Because yeah, so we didn't, even though you do have the, the functionality of increasing it um, by a certain percent each time, for this trial, what we did was we started with two sets of 10 for most of our participants. Then when they could do three sets of 10 and then we build them up to three sets of 15. And once that was to, was dropping below, um, like that was too easy on the Borg scale, then we increased the weights. I think so we increased the repetitions up starting with two sets of 10 until they got to three sets of 15. And then we bumped up the weights. And we did that because they were very old and had multiple comorbidities and I was particularly careful not to be the cause of adverse events. So there was potential, but that wasn't heavy enough. And I worried about that for about five years until the results came in and we got the results anyway. <laughs> I, think that, I think that's so good because that's the, people often forget that that's the different ways of increasing the resistance. Yeah. Either increasing, increasing sets or increasing reps, that there's all the different modalities and we often forget about that. So I think it's a good reminder. Yeah. Now, thank you so much. It's time for us to move on to the community. Um, so it's time for me. Thank you so much. And again, to everyone, the slides will be posted for you. And now there's another q and A. I'll do that for the next one. And there's a question for Emily. We'll respond. Maybe Jenny, you can answer that. Then I will just and then talk, and you'll see the question. Sure, I can have a look. Thank you. Awesome. So the next speaker is Justin Kiao. Justin is an associate professor at Bond University. And the topic of his talk is optimizing outcomes for exercise programs for kids loving older adults. Um, now, Justin, uh, so Justin is an associate professor at Bonn Uni, where he's teaching motor control and motor learning, also exercise prescription and also research design. He also, his, a lot of his research is focusing on sarcopenia, so periodic condition where your muscles are just wasting away. And also its potential relationship on HK utilization. Um, also, some of his research examines the determinants of exercise and physical activity in older populations. Now, just, uh, Justin also worked together with Tim Henwood on the Muscling Up Against Disability project, which really looked at the exercise modalities for community health. And also on, on to that note, um, together with Tim, Justin was the winner of the 2019 Sustainable Healthcare Awards. Um, Justin's, Justin's all ready to go, so go ahead, Justin, you will have your 15 minutes. Thanks for joining us. All right, thanks um, very much, Toria, and uh, her for this opportunity. Um, just quickly, can everyone see my screen? All right, so um, I'm looking today at um, optimising outcomes from exercise programs for older people living within the community. So what I wanted to do to start with was just to discuss, similar to what um, Jenny spoke about, some of the differences and similarities between physical activity, exercise and therapeutic exercise. So physical activity, um, lots of examples there, but just general movement uh, that requires some energy expenditure. So walking and gardening, again, there's some benefits to that. A subset of physical activity is exercise, which is more planned, structured, and which use it to intend to improve uh, a physical fitness component such as muscular strength or aerobic fitness. So things such as getting into the gym, resistance training, swimming, cycling are all examples of that. And again, they've got good benefits for many older adults, but particularly because many older adults have a host of um, comorbidities, we, as Jenny suggested, we can use exercise like we can use a medical uh, therapy, um, pharmacological prescription to assist in preventing or managing a health condition. So we look to target those symptoms or side effects that the older person is living with, with particular types of exercise. So when we look at um, what might be, what are the most important outcomes for older adults? Most of them, their primary importance will be improving and maintaining their functional performance of common everyday activities, their physical performance, and also their cognition. Because um, ultimately a loss of physical or cognitive function will lead to aged care um, requirements and perhaps entry into residential aged care. To do that, as exercise professionals, we look at the secondary um, outcomes here. So muscular strength and power, balance, are probably the two most important for more older adults, 
But again, things like body composition, increasing the proportion of muscle and bone, reducing fat is important, as well as their cardiovascular and respiratory function. Um, so again, those make up the important part of our exercise therapeutic prescription. Um, I've got lots of slides. I'm, I'm a full-time academic at the moment, so we won't get through any of the, all of those, but there's some appendices that will be included at the end of these slides for those who really want to go over some of the, um, the science behind these recommendations. So one of the issues is we can't screen everyone. So um, there might be some quick, easy assessments that we, we might need to do. And the SARC-F or the SARC-F plus measuring calf girth is a simple example of that. I'll show you a slide of that in a minute. Or again, you might look to use components of the European Working Group for Sarcopenia, which is recommended in Australia and New Zealand, where um, we use hand grip, strength, gait speed, or sit to stand tests as measures of muscle function. And we might look at body composition via DEXA, um, or perhaps more feasibly by BIA. There are still some controversies regarding the cut points to use for muscle mass, but probably the strength and the physical performance measures are, are more predictive of disability anyway. Here is the SARC-F on the left-hand side of the screen. It comprises five simple questions that look at strength down to falls. We have a three-point scale uh, from no difficulty to a lot or unable, and scores that are uh, four or above um, are indicative of probable sarcopenia. So again, that can be done within about one to two minutes for many older adults. Uh, one of my PhD students, Samantha Thien, who graduated a few years ago, uh, her PhD focused on, on walking ability, and she came up with this flowchart um, to assist healthcare professionals and older people uh, understand what their risks are in terms of, um, oh, sorry, their recommended approach, where 0.8 meters per second is the sarcopenic threshold for low gait speed. Um, so again, where the allied health assessments, um, resistance and balance training become highly recommended. So we'll now talk about the Muscling Up Against Disability study, which was funded uh, by the Department of Social Services. Uh, here is a, a snapshot of the, the study protocol. Lots of details on there, but very similar to what Jenny uh, conducted. 24 week exercise program for two hours per week. So 48 hours of training in total using the HER equipment. Again, very similar exercises to what she utilized. Three sets of eight to 12 repetitions. Um, a range of balance exercises, predominantly static and some dynamic. Um, and the resistance was increased um, throughout the 24 weeks to maintain that level of intensity after a four week sort of familiarization um, period where the um, participants were eased into the program. And all of these sessions were supervised by accredited exercise physiologists um, at the Bernie Bray Center uh, in Brisbane. Here are a few publications from the study at the moment, and we're still looking on a few extras as well. Uh, the top one there is the report that we um, submitted back to the government a few years ago. I'll just go through a couple of the, the primary um, important results. What we really wanted to do with this trial was not just to show that it's effective in improving function and strength, et cetera, but to show that progressive resistance and balance training can work in the community and it can actually be cost effective. Uh, and that many older adults will actually um, take up the opportunity. So um, let's just have a look at some of the results. So uh, we had high uptake within the program, something like 256 older individuals accessing home and community care were involved. And the, probably the most interesting uh, values here were, when we look at the cost, um, the program did cost over $1,800 uh, per participant if we provided them free travel with a, a minibus. But for those who are able to get to the centre on their own, the costs were only $303. So what that meant was uh, for those participants who could get there without um, incurring costs onto the centre, it was 99% uh, likely to be cost effective. And these costs, even the $1,800 with the full travel um, provided, when we look at that to the UK, it might still be a good investment. What we have on the right-hand side here is um, individuals in the dark gray bars with those who've been defined as muscle uh, weakness. So for men, less than 26 kilograms of hand grip strength and less than 16 for women. Um, and ultimately, what that represented to the UK healthcare system 
was an extra £2,707 per person per year who was below that level of strength. So that's a huge cost to the healthcare system that can be easily addressed by uh, progressive resistance training. So some things that we've learned from this trial and, and other sort of projects we've been involved with, um, progressive resistance and balance training are often the two key forms of therapeutic exercise, but progressive is the, the biggest thing there. It needs to be progressed. And we typically can do that by increasing the load that they lift in an exercise. So if a client starts with two kilograms in an exercise, your goal as the exercise professional is to encourage them when they can to lift three kilograms, four kilos, et cetera. And when we look at exercise for balance, and again, Jenny mentioned some of the challenges in doing it, um, we need to move from static to dynamic, make things a bit more fun, large to small basis of support, perhaps raise their center of gravity by lifting their arms over their head, and also doing some pro or reactive balance exercises. So things that are functional involving stepping up and down, and dual tasks again to increase that cognition. Um, more information is provided in Appendix B. Uh, in particular, there's a meta-analysis that was published five years ago, similar to what Jenny spoke about, and increasing strength, uh, there are some of the key prescription variables where the effect is maximized. Two sessions per week, two to three sets per exercise, seven to nine repetitions, using loads in the 70% of one rep max, um, six second repetition, so two to three seconds up, three to four seconds on the way down, and about one minute rest. Um, similar recommendations for muscle mass, but uh, one extra training session per week and slightly longer rest periods and reduced loads. Supervision by exercise experts, be it an exercise physiologist or a physiotherapist initially is vital, at least for the first few months, to get the older person comfortable in the gym, good technique, et cetera. Within our project, we might have benefited from some more dynamic and pro or reactive balance exercises, that functional stepping. Um, and again, Jenny looked like she had some great options there. And again, these can be progressed by carrying different loads, similar to carrying shopping bags, perhaps in one hand or two hands, dual tasks where they do mathematics, they sing songs, they read signs, or they react to different stimuli as their confidence and movement competency improves. Um, and all of these cognitive sensory components will further increase their ability to perform activities of daily living, reduce their falls rates, and improve their cognition. Because many falls actually occur when we're doing a dual task. Um, so keys to success. Um, we should look to, um, in addition to the resistance training, um, and again, machines like her are great as a, as a large component of that, some things like lunges, step-ups, or loaded carries are really important in terms of these functional transfer exercises. Um, HER offers a great machine, the pulley system, where you can utilize a cable and do standing or bent over presses, rows, and twists. And again, this is, is very lifelike in terms of the activities of daily living. As Jenny said, balance training can be boring because we often get people to stand still. Not much fun doing that. Um, so again, we need to incorporate dual tasks, unpredictability, um, games, task representative perturbations um, that they do in the real life. And again, some of these could perhaps be included in their warm-ups or using some of the balance and strength training exercises as well. Um, in terms of cost effectiveness, um, Jenny's program in the aged care um, residential space, ours in the community have indicated they can be cost effective. Um, but again, this is partly where the clients adhere to the program and are able to organize their own transport to the clinic. So when we think about the community, where we place or where we think about having a gym is really important. So in the general community, perhaps near bus or train routes or within walking distance of things like supermarkets um, is really important. And if you're thinking the retirement village, again, is there a community hall that many residents access weekly and how easy it is for them to get there? So those are some key things to consider. Sorry. Um, when we think about maximizing retention and adherence, it's really important that from the CEO down to the staff that interact with the clients, that we create a very strong, supportive social environment for our clients. Um, basically create a new family for them. So 
The two centres I've been most involved with, Bernie Bray in Brisbane and the Never Too Old program in northern parts of New Zealand, were amazing at the, the sort of social environments they've created. Um, it's really important for the exercise professionals to listen to their clients, understand the issues they face in their everyday lives, as well as their fears or misconceptions or barriers regarding exercise, particularly things that might not be common to them. We need to ensure then we write the prescription that it focuses not just on their health condition, maybe improving their blood glucose or something like that, but also that it improves their ability to be independent and active and perform those activities that bring the most meaning to their life. We need to provide them with regular feedback um, on their progress. So again, doing some assessments um, across the program. Her's great, you've got the equipment. You can say, oh, Mrs. Jones, you've increased your strength. You're lifting twice the amount of weight you lifted four weeks ago. So again, uh, that's great, but also asking them how they're feeling at home. Is it helping them do certain activities, et cetera? And when you introduce new exercises, particularly those that might be challenging or maybe some that they don't enjoy, talk about the importance of that exercise to their unique requirements. So again, if they want to get back into something like lawn bowls or golfing, how that exercise will help them perform that activity um, effectively and safely. Um, and again, there's more detail in Appendix C around some of those uh, things in terms, particularly a community-based program we did in New Zealand, the Never Too Old. So that's a quick snapshot of a range of things in the community. If anyone's got any questions, I'd be uh, willing to take them. And thank you for I must have said thank you, Justin. I heard the bell wasn't her, and I rang it like a crazy woman and even unmuted my microphone, but no one heard anything, so I'm happy in the matter of time. <laughs> Sorry. So oh, he was perfect. So, you know, I didn't know what else to do. I was gonna yell one minute, but they were perfect. Um, I have a question for you. I, I well actually have again a number of questions. Um, so Jenny did her assessment in a subjective manner. Did you make you best yours in one RM? And if you did, how many trials did you allow for the one RM and then calculated it? Or how did you assess your baseline? Yeah, ours was again a, a semi quantitative approach. Um, because the HER equipment allows you to record the repetition sets and loads that um, the participants used, uh, we use that as the basis of our um, increased loads. So uh, pretty much around every four weeks, we'd look at those loads that they've been lifting. And then based on our understanding as exercise professionals, if someone can do three sets of eight with a particular load um, or three sets of 10 within that ballpark, we would then prescribe them a new load um, based on those percentage um, conversions between reps and sets and the new increase in, in load. So. Again, it was partially subjective, but it was um, nicely augmented by the HER um, recording system of, of their sets and reps. I think, I think to me, that's just one of the key important messages, because I think a lot of people are afraid of the measurement and the definitions and, and, and also the progressions that we too yeah, often yeah. stay too long. I admit it when I started. So my, some of my classes were ridiculous. So the veterans came and said, told me and said, hey girl, can we do a bit harder stuff? This is boring, which was my learning experience. And thus we asking now people who really work in the industry. Um, I have another question. So with strength training, we know that we can attack cognition, or not attack, but we can target cognition, we can talk or target falls, we can target independent skate speed, everything else. Do you think one sort of cookbook solution is enough or is there ways of targeting particular areas such as, for example, if you work with a dementia group or if you work in a post-stroke group, how would you adjust, is there a way of adjusting it or how would you do it? Um, ultimately, the principles will remain the same, but I suppose you've got the, be it the exercise physiologist or the physiotherapist who's in charge needs to be aware of that, perhaps that group sort of pathology. If it's something like a dementia group or a stroke group, what are some of the common issues they're going to face with their movement and cognition? Um, so the baseline, I suppose, program in terms of its difficulty will differ to perhaps some of the individuals that are accessing Bernie Bray or uh, Never Told um, in the community as an example. Um, but ultimately, the progressions you can get for some of those groups can, can still be very, um, very large. But again, we just gotta be, I think, and Jenny sort of said it really nicely that we 
have to be very conservative, perhaps in the first two to four weeks, we get them to do tasks that we think they can do somewhat easily. Um, and when each individual goes, oh, that was easy. Well, again, that's a great way for that person to feel um, that they've achieved something, that they've exceeded our expectations as exercise professionals, rather than going in with something that's much too challenging for them. So different physiotherapists or physiologists might start to specialize with different groups. And I think that um, particularly in the future um, and in the larger metropolitan locations will be uh, really something exciting to see how people who work in a group of um, a small population such as stroke or dementia might develop some amazing sort of experiences and do research at the same time to demonstrate the effectiveness of those variations of the of the same sort of exercise prescriptions. Um, that's fantastic. I was going to, I think we're running out of time, but I was going to ask you one more question, which is going to be how to motivate people. That's, I think that's a challenge for so many people, but I'll let you type down that answer so we can move on to Paul who's waiting. Um, thank you so much, Justin. Thanks for sharing. And I really think for everyone who's listening, like if I, when I train staff, these are the two papers I always come back to. When you look at the papers, there will be a clear instruction exercise prescription protocols. So we've shared the links. Please look at the papers because they really, they really work and they nicely explain everything. All right, we have the next slides ready, so I'm going to introduce our next speaker. So Paul Johnson, who is from Ballycara, is going to be talking about creating a new business opportunity. Uh, Paul is the Chief Opportunity Officer at Balikara and has performed a lead role in the design and implementation of their health and wellness services. Um, Paul has been working in the aged care industry for over two decades in a different roles. So he's been a service provider, also an industry advisor and also a public servant. Um, Paul is really passionate about exceptional customer service, redefining aging, enjoying life and a great cup of coffee. And he really is that. Uh, Paul was one of the first uh, person people actually uh, heard uh, her talking when I joined um, when I joined her five years ago. So I will always remember that talk and really hearing about the impact um, that we can do in an aged care facility. Also, one of the important things is that Paul actively engages with the key stakeholders across Australia, and also to continue to contribute to the national policy development. Really. Um, prior to reform the Australia's aged care system through the, his involvement with Laser Lhasa. I know I was going to ask this before, is it Laser Lhasa? I don't know, so apologies to everyone. I will verify my acronyms next time. So welcome, Paul. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm very much looking forward to your talk. Thanks, Tura. Thanks, Ari. And thank you, Her, for the opportunity today. I'm assuming people can uh, hear me. Uh, a wonderful experience uh, to do this virtually. Uh, haven't we all needed to adapt so much this, uh, this year? Um, today, I guess I'm uh, not coming from the academic um, perspective. I'll have to confess, I'm not even a, a, a um, allied health professional myself, but um, I certainly there's many days that I, uh, I wish that, uh, and it's not too late, I guess, to go and, uh, and, and embark on um, further study in, in that field. But um, today I really want to talk about how Ballycara is leading with healthy and happy living, um, and particularly how we've embraced uh, exercise um, um, in, in that uh, spirit. Our SAUNA methodology is uh, very uh, much at the centre of all that we do. SAUNA being the Gaelic word for happiness, uh, and that really connects with our uh, Irish um, heritage as, a, as an organisation. Um, essentially, sort of three key pillars of embracing individuality, skills and passions, enhancing independence and daily living, and really allowing and encouraging people to prosper in, uh, with new opportunities and in real happiness. It, it, it really is about authentic relationships with people. And some of you may um, certainly have uh, seen and, and heard the research that was done and released uh, a few years ago now um, in partnership with QUT in regards to our SAUNA methodology, particularly applied in residential aged care. Today, however, I wanna talk more about how we've really 
uh, embarked uh, using sauna, but then also really uh, embarking on a new business uh, area as an organisation and um, really in the health and wellness uh, space. So in 2013, here at our uh, Scarborough uh, Retirement Village, a wellness centre was open and a, uh, a very contemporary and, and you know, uh, nicely fitted out uh, building, uh, as you can see, uh, with, with a range of amenities inside and out, um, in, including a coffee shop uh, inside. The planning had allowed for a small um, area to be allocated uh, for, for the purpose of a gym. And that was one of my early challenges was to, um, to fit out uh, the space uh, with the right equipment and to then really be building a wellness program around that. So not just using, not just about the gym, but the adjoining uh, larger open spaces. Uh, having already in my previous uh, travels, um, you know, seen the, the real uh, benefits and virtues of the hair equipment, it was a no brainer for me to, to start uh, with that. And uh, I threw Ari the challenge, I guess, of uh, fitting out this space um, with as many um, pieces of equipment that we could um, in, uh, in, in still being a, um, a workable uh, and functional space. We started with uh, one exercise uh, physiologist there and an allied health assistant and, and really uh, embarked on, I guess, co-designing uh, a wellness program uh, with the village community in particular. However, it was to also be open to the broader community. And I think that was one of the um, you know, key differentiators for this new building, although being on our retirement village site, it was about engaging, in, engaging with the broader community of seniors. Uh, we obviously had to balance the, um, the expectations of village residents uh, in, in doing that as well. But um, from day one, I guess, we, we uh, made, you know, we're, we're clear in our communication and in our um, engagement with them. Uh, we developed membership model with tiers. We thought, um, you know, were, would be very enticing. Importantly, we tested those models with focus groups from within the village. And I guess heard some really key messages that, um, that you know, required us to adjust our thinking and expectations. People wanted it to be affordable. They certainly wanted it to be flexible, noting that they may uh, be, you know, likely to be holidaying away, be, fall ill and maybe, you know, um, in hospital at times. They didn't want to be locked into something ongoing week upon week. They wanted more fluidity in, in how they engage with it. They certainly welcomed variety. It wasn't just about um, gym and gym equipment. Um, they wanted group-based activities and, and a holistic focus. So we officially launched in, uh, in October 2014. You can see one of the early programs there. And, and I guess, um, you know, we, like other organisations, sort of sought to bring that uh, variety uh, across the week. And things, some things we didn't deliver ourselves. We certainly partnered with other um, professionals to do that. Uh, one of the things that I guess we really called out from day one was the state of art, uh, state of the art um, uh, equipment that we had invested um, in, the her equipment, and certainly some new words in my vocabulary, including pneumatic air resistance, uh, needed to flow off the tongue. Um, one of our early challenges back to her and Ari was give us some Australian uh, images to help with our um, sell to um, our local clientele. We ended up creating some of our own and I think sharing, sharing some of those with, back, with, back with her as well. Um, but uh, her has certainly um, also uh, you know, got a lot more resources um, in, that, in that regard now. Uh, are very much committed to a holistic model of wellness. Exercise being a core focus, um, but as I said, it had to be offered in a variety of ways. Social connection was of equal value. And I guess mental well-being a value add. We didn't necessarily lead with, with that um, as a 
um, the, the number one selling point. However, it was incorporated within our programs and, and service offerings each week and, and continues to be you know, an, an important part. Uh, I guess the journey then continued and in 2017, we were delighted to be one of the first organisations in Australia to receive an allocation of short-term restorative care places. Um, and I know Joe, our next speaker also uh, is in, in, in that space as well. Um, it is an Australian government program uh, funded under the Aged Care Act. Not enough uh, focus and airtime is given to the worth of this program. And so uh, I'm certainly keen to continue to shout from the rooftops around the real value this program has within how we support our ageing population uh, across Australia. It's a short duration, high intensity uh, program of restoration, uh, which has to have a multidisciplinary focus and must engage with people's uh, general practitioner. I'm pleased to say we've now got 41 places across two regions. It doesn't sound that many, but um, 41 places every eight weeks um, really means that there's um, you know, significant people that are impacting in a really meaningful way each year. And obviously the, the Australian government continues to grow the allocation and across a range of providers. For us, uh, we deliberately chose to um, implement a coaching model and a really meaning-centred um, approach in that regard. Coaching model, and we chose exercise physiology, physiologists as our lead coaches. I'd have to say, and I'll con and, you know, certainly continue to um, uh, spruik their wares, exercise physiologists for us have been one of the key um, ingredients in um, successfully implementing um, exercise and health and wellness uh, offerings. The um, current funding sources for our health and wellness um, programs obviously include short-term restorative care. We link into the Commonwealth Home Support Program where we can, home care packages also, private health insurance, Medicare, the Department of Veteran Affairs, even local governments, um, you know, uh, through some of their subsidised um, exercise programs and grants, and of course, user pays. So I think, you know, a key message too is about considering all of those options. And it's an area where you just have to, and you, and you have the flexibility to reach out to as many different funding sources as you can to make, make it a really viable um, part of your business. Uh, for us, we see it as a continued strategic growth. Um, you can see it here in South East Queensland and even down to, to Northern New South Wales now. It doesn't mean that we have uh, a village in each of those locations or a wellness centre to the same um, standard as, as what I showed you earlier at Scarborough, but it means we are seeing the opportunity to engage in those local communities. Picking up on Justin's point earlier, it's about taking it, making it accessible um, to, to people in the local community. Uh, we don't have, um, you know, the same uh, fortunate access to um, some of that CHSP transport funding ourselves. We certainly strive to meet that transport gap where we, you know, can. But it's about also being this being part of. Um, the normal community for people. Uh, and that for us is how we establish ourselves in different regions in different ways, um, but leading with, um, with exercise. I've finished. Heard that. <laughs> Thanks, Jerry. Um, we haven't stopped there. I guess we, we also now, you know, further in that community engagement space uh, we're delighted to be the active ageing partner with Netball Queensland and particularly sponsoring their walking netball initiative um, to really tap into another area of uh, life and for those people that have had an interest and, and a real passion in sport throughout their life um, and want to continue to do that in a modified way. We've sponsored local fun runs and, and uh, the Jetty to Jetty on the Redcliffe Peninsula there, as you can see, and also being open to research. Um, I haven't had the fortune of working with uh, Jenny or Justin at this point, but um, you know, certainly other opportunities that have come along to us, including 
um, the Healthy Beat Acupunch an initiative, um, which has recently been, um, been published. Um, and we're keen to, um, you know, trial a, a broader rollout of, of that. Um, so I think it's, it, for us, it's, it's an area that we continue to see further opportunities um, to really um, have that impact across. And it's not just about impacting older people or seniors, it's about the whole community, but really celebrating um, people regardless of age or, um, or health or frailty. So in, in closing, Tura, you'll be pleased to know my keys to success are certainly invest in the right exercise equipment. And I have to say her is, is worth very much worth the investment for um, many of the reasons that Justin um, already, you know, uh, talked about um, the ease of use, the um, the, the programming, the uh, there's no cheating involved, the reporting, the accountability back to individuals, uh, as well as the fact that it is a safe work environment, you know, safe exercise environment for people, and you can have you know multiple people uh, at different machines supervised by an exercise physiologist at once. Uh, certainly invest in suitable space and location, uh, the importance of being accessible and visible, as, as visible as possible. Um, investing in the right workforce, accredited, ex accredited exercise physiologists are gold. I, I cannot um, uh, you know, compliment that, that uh, discipline and profession enough. And, and finally, I guess, invest in your brand uh, and, uh, and the customer experience. Uh, finally, I think it's important that we all walk the talk. Um, this is actually an image of myself at, at, in my exercise regime, and I think it's something that we should all, if we are passionate and, and see opportunities in this space, in the people that we support, we should also be you know, living that out uh, in, our, in our own daily lives. So um, thank you all and, and happy to take some questions. Thank you so much, Paul. I'm pretty impressed with the photo and I'm happy that you'll have to leave that image there for the whole time so we can all. I'm pretty, I have never seen you that focus on training, so well done. Um, I have lots of questions for you. Um, first one, moving forward, how do we implement these models in the current COVID market and postings and also group sessions? Yeah, it's a really good point, Tura, and I, I uh, didn't cover that, I guess, specifically today. We have certainly adjusted our delivery models to uh, virtual platforms like, um, like Zoom. Um, however, we've also seen, you know, the, the real uh, importance of continuing um, individual face-to-face -face, uh, sessions for some people. Obviously, we're doing that in a COVID safe way. Um, it, it was one of the greatest challenges earlier on, I think with sort of the blanket restrictions of um, for people 70 years and over to be isolating at home and uh, um, you know, restricting their interaction with other people. We've really strived all the way along to not um, suspend uh, services rather than to continue, but to do it in a safe way. And, and the way that um, the people that we're working with uh, you know, um, uh, are accepting of. So um, I think just we are in a more fortunate position, I recognise, than, than in Victoria and, and other parts of the world. Um, when I, and so I do recognise in, in saying that, but um, I think it is about how we do it, embrace technology, but also not replace that real need for human-to-human -human interaction and and ensure that if it is virtual, that we're also meeting that social and emotional connection um, as well. Fantastic. Now, the next one. Um, do the local governments cover just the charges of gym usage or also subsidise part of the elderly gym equipment purchase? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a good question. Um, obviously, different local governments in different regions of Australia are, um, you know, uh, approach it differently. In our experience, um, I guess, where the local government has, has supported us, it's been subsidising attendance. And in some instances, we're using their venues, um, community halls, which aren't necessarily, you know, fitted out with the gym equipment. But it's about how we continue, how we provide the you know strength and resistance training 
um, with uh, you know, a, a range of portable, uh, portable equipment. In some, in some instances, they will subsidise um, capital uh, equipment um, and uh, providing you can demonstrate, I guess, that you know, it's going to be open to the broader community or you know, how, it, how it will be um, targeted to particular groups of people. I think I really like the slide you had about the funding models because there is so many. And also I think the, the great thing for funding is that there is so much research now, like there's both Jenny's study and Justin's study and there's number of more, many more, I love Mare Federone Singh's group studies. So there's a lot of information coming through. So we should be helping with grants and then you can really make the point. Um, one more question for you. How are you setting up in community areas if you're not accessing the wellness centre you created at Palikara? So for us, um, it's about, uh, at this stage, we've got a few other locations, one in North Brisbane and uh, one in the Logan region, and we're actually leasing um, premises there. Um, and both of those, one of them is in a, in a retail strip, uh, but we've allocated, you know, enough space for gym equipment as well as group um, ex uh, exercises to, to be done. Our latest offering in, in North Brisbane um, has just opened and we're really fortunate to have a space that's big enough that's got a separate designated gym space and then um, the, uh, the open spaces for... Um, uh, for group exercise and, and, and hiring out. And I think that's the important thing that in, in some of these cases, we can't do, we can't achieve that vision totally on our own. It's about how we also work with other like organisations who might want to be sub-tenants or, or work, you know, utilise some of our spaces with us. Um, uh, in, uh, in that community engagement space. So, um, you know, other providers that are also um, keen to be using the equipment um, or, um, or using some spaces for, um, for their activities. That's fantastic. Look, thank you, Paul. I think you've given lots of great ideas and, and really like this was the, one of the first projects. This was the first one I saw in Australia. So you really made an impression on me then and always keep on making me happier every time I see you and hear because it's I love to hear when programs really work. So. Thank you for always doing great and thank you for joining us. Um, with that, I know there are some other questions that popped up, we'll answer them later. Um, as it is time for me to present our last speaker for today. So our next speaker is Joe Boylan, um, who is the Executive of Services at Southern Cross Care. Um, now Joe has a vision of improved health across the life cycle and live on healthy ageing for health improvement despite age of illness. And over the past 10 years, she's been a leading organisation of reorientations towards healthy ageing across the residential community and retirement living communities. With her operational team, Jo has led the implementation of over 25 gyms in residential home, homes and her health ageing achievements include development and implementation of healthy ageing models. We're very lucky to have Cho here as well today. She travels all around the world and then, um, then you know, and presents her things. So we're thrilled to have you here, Cho. I welcome you. Have your next 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Yes. Fantastic. Off we go. Well, I could sit back and listen all day um, to Justin and Jenny and Paul. I've been very inspired and I think we're very lucky to... Um, have such amazing uh, talent in uh, Australia who uh, push this very, very important topic, particularly for our uh, aged people. Uh, so I've got a slide here of Rodney. So Rodney came to us when he was about 86. He had a stroke. He uh, was really depressed because um, he had lost uh, movement in one side of his body and all he wanted to do was to stop using his frame and to be able to walk without an aid and he was so so committed and so passionate uh, about exercising that he came every day and within six weeks Rodney was walking without a frame so I'm just going to give you a bit of an oversight today uh, explaining our large-scale health promotion approach 
at Southern Cross Care in South Australia, uh, Northern Territory and Victoria. And our whole of organisation changed. The whole, the whole organisation changed our approach. Uh, and in particular, I'll give you results around what has happened in residential aged care. And in residential aged care, we are funded just like everyone else with the ACFI. So this is uh, our new model, our new Better for Life model. And you can see very clearly my areas of um, direct leadership is around uh, our services, which you can see we've made a, an absolute commitment to health promotion. Uh, we see health promotion as our core business. So in that, we take on that very proactive approach. So we have a, an extensive amount of allied health in um, our homes, um, three times as much. Uh, we have EPs and we have personal trainers as well. There's a gym uh, in every one of our aged care homes with her equipment, uh, not all her equipment, but lots of it. And we have a very integrated approach to health and wellbeing. We believe that you need all of the disciplines to help a person, not just one discipline. So it's very holistic. We look at uh, what is important to the person and we try very hard uh, from understanding what's important to them and joining them up with um, health and wellbeing. So it's a, it is a contemporary approach. We always try and bring best practice into everything that we do. And of course, we have to be person-centered um, and passionate to be able to do that. So why has Southern Cross Care focused on health promotion and making healthy normal rather than decline normal? We've done this because it's, we believe it's a human right uh, that everyone has access to the products and services that improve their life. And for many, many years, um, traditional aged care homes have not really had that access to uh, the people and the goods and equipment that will help reverse frailty, often the reason that brings them into aged care. So we've gone about, as, I, as I've said, we've got uh, 17 homes and we've gone about putting gyms in, into each of those homes. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about those gyms. So the, we've got a, a set amount of uh, equipment and the types of equipment, so we've standardised it. We've put in uh, full-time hours into all of those gyms, mostly full-time hours, depending on the size of the um, home, so that there's always someone in the gym to receive the person and to help them um, uh, exercise safely. So we have between four and six people in a gym at a time, um, and the focus is on improving people's resistance and their balance. So this is just a little bit of uh, where we're thinking. Uh, we're, we're very influenced and informed by the World Health Organization's focus on uh, goal three, the sustainable goals, which is about improving good health and well-being of everyone. So also our staff. Um, can access our gyms at all of the sites and in the community, uh, which really gives them a fr free membership. Uh, so that's a wonderful thing. So in our work day to day, we uh, are focused on helping people reduce that fitness gap and keeping them above the disability threshold and helping them reach their potential and of course preventing disability. As I explained, we have a, a strong focus on getting as many people as possible to access the gym and the people that can help improve their fitness and reduce that uh, fitness gap. So as you can see, on a large scale, um, how we're doing, and it gives you uh, an idea that it can be done. Sometimes you, can, you start around the 40%, but it gives you an idea of um, how, how you can actually monitor uh, everyone who's participating in the gym and those that are not. And you can see we've got a fairly high level of uh, engagement in tailored exercises. That's people going to the gym. 
Um, as a result, you also have uh, increased people being able to wait there, walk, uh, and so on. So that's our focus. We measure all of this because uh, we don't uh, want to just uh, talk. We want to walk the talk and be very authentic in our commitment to helping people have that better life. So our focus is on helping people uh, maintain their function as much as we can, because we know that when people are are able to walk, they're able to get in and out of a car, that uh, enables them to do the things that they love and, and what's important to them. We know that it's very hard to do all the things that you love when you're sitting in a wheelchair or a princess chair. So we try our very hardest to prevent anyone going into a, a, any sort of chair if we can. To do this, um, large scale strategy that I'm talking about, this commitment, um, having health promotion as core business across the whole organisation, you have to really prepare and upskill your workforce and to really get them to understand how they can prevent those poor health outcomes, that they, that they are mostly preventable. And to also uh, increase the health literacy around the residents themselves. Uh, in residential and in community to help them be stronger as well, strengthen their abilities to thrive. So as I've explained, we do have gyms uh, across all of our residential sites and, and across all of our community as well. We've got three um, gyms and most of our gyms have cafes attached so that you can really, uh, you know, Paul was talking about creating that uh, good physical um, uh, a pro fit commitment to physical health, but also to get that social component in there as well. So you sort of makes up going to the gym does make up for having that cake and coffee after. So our, our exercise classes are tailored, uh, focused on resistance and balance. They're about 20 to 30 minutes long. We try to get our residents to come at least two to three times a week. They have personal trainers or EPs in um, all of the gyms, four to six residents. Um, and if people are a little bit resistant or reluctant to come to the gyms, we go to them in their rooms or we get a group of people together where we can do those sessions or we'll do the one-to-one. -one. We, we also are very aware that walking is not enough. So this is a, a, a fantastic um, slide and I could just sit and talk about this slide for uh, half an hour because it's really working on keeping people above that disability threshold where they're not about to go into a princess chair or a, um, a, a, a wheelchair, uh, so which is where that purple line is taking them. That's a trajectory into that sort of uh, aid. And to push them up above that line uh, along the green line and keep people um, still walking, still functional. Sometimes that green line is a one to two person assist. It's not always, particularly in residential, it's not always independence, but it's uh, a much more, um, they're still able to functionally get around with assistance. Our focus is on treating frailty with exercise and ensuring that we have really good supplements and good nutrition to fuel and energize the body. We have a, a to be able to do all of this, it's not just the gym uh, that we look at, we also have a multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary approach to early intervention. Uh, we have early intervention meetings every fortnight, uh, and uh, this is um, a very professional. A group of people that come together to enhance resident quality of life and functional ability and that's that's the focus. Five minutes. Five okay. minutes. Okay, the uh, site manager is very much uh, looking at why is this person declining or, or they've come in with decline and getting down to the root cause of what's going on uh, why, and what can we do, what are the enablers and barriers. The allied health um, develop a physical recovery plan or the lifestyle coordinator may, coordinator may 
develop a social recovery plan and the health and wellness um, help uh, support both plans in the gym uh, and doing that progression uh, as both Justin and Jenny have spoken about. So in, a, in aged care, of course, we've got the four Bs, uh, but our, we've got, uh, I was actually uh, uh, called to the Royal Commission to talk about this model. Uh, and they asked, how come I've got three times the much as much allied health as um, many other uh, aged care homes? Uh, and our focus is on keeping people on their feet and walking until they die. So we do look at falls prevention very strongly, keeping people mobile, uh, uh, motivating people uh, as well uh, with the personal trainers and the lifestyle, of course, the social component. And we have a strong uh, support to the allied health in this group. So uh, we have KPIs, which I've shown you some of those, and they're about preventing falls, um, reducing immobility, experiencing uh, the experience of good quality of life, regular tailored progressive exercises and meaningful activities. So I'll go a little bit faster. Uh, meaningful activities, we measure that as well. We've got a threshold of 20 activities per month and we look at to ensure that people are supported and promoted and motivated to engage physically and um, socially. We also use the World Health Quality of Life breath, um, and we measure quality of life on admission and then six months thereafter. And we've been able to keep our quality of life up very high. And this, this was done just in July. Uh, uh, all of this data was done in July and you can see it's very high even during uh, the pandemic, which is quite interesting, isn't it? Particularly when um, aged care has been uh, accused of locking people away. You can see that our people were at the gym and you can see the correlation between quality of life and people being able to walk. It's very important that people can keep walking, keep being functional so that they can get to that good quality of life. So it's very important for people to, for us in particular as health professionals to tap into what is important to the person. And then we can work together to, to work out what is important for them. But that what is important to them is fundamental. Uh, uh, accessing, um, assessing interventions that are effective, uh, which Jenny and both Justin have made that comment, and changing the interventions if they don't work and continuously increasing the intensity of frequency. This just gives you an idea. We have person-centered software and we're able to track uh, all interventions that are provided to every resident. And so this is a very easy tool for us to schedule exercise into um, residents' daily life, uh, exercise, of course, that they want to be a part of, and for ensuring that it is being done. Uh, and this is the beauty of that tool. So I'll leave you on this slide. Actually, one more slide I have to talk about the uh, Age World Conference that is coming up online. It is free. If you go to Everbright and uh, register, it's for anyone on the 12th of October. And again, it's about exercise uh, and health and wellbeing in general for people living in the community, but also in aged care. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, Jo. That was fantastic. Absolutely loved it. Um, what actually impressed me when I, I really like one of your favorite comments that you said was when you said that um, it's really about keeping but like the walking is not enough but the fact that the exercise allows you to keep walking and I think that's one of the messages that sometimes people don't don't think they um, forget that you need to exercise but if you're not healthy you can't go for a walk but if you start you start at the basics and start at the hundred grand start exercising just a little bit your goal is you can then get up and you keep on going and then trying to link the exercises that you do into the future and really the goal setting and motivation. Because I think that's that's one of the big things is just the goal setting. Oh, so the goal setting is so important. Yeah. So, so important. And if we can just get that little hook in, that little link in to what's important to them, they'll often say, oh, my family. And you can say, well, 
you know, tell me about your family. Oh, I like to visit them. And I would say, well, you, we need to get you stronger so that you can get in and out of the car so that you can go and visit your family. And so the focus becomes uh, strengthening the legs so that they can see the family. So it's always got a little hook in to what's important to them. It's, it's an appreciative inquiry concept. Yeah, and I like the fact that all of you have uh, mentioned the coffees and the cakes. I mean, <laughs> that's also the thing is that, you know, we exercise to be able to go there and, and eating. And I remember we were at the conference that Joe just mentioned, the age well one. We had last year, um, Nari, who was our speaker, and the first one was also giving a talk there. And we had this conversation that it really is great because there's protein. And, and so we can then go have your exercise and then have your cake. It's okay. Unless, unless, you're <laughs> unless you're in a very specific situation where you can't, but you can really combine exercise and wellness with joy. Um, now, one thing I actually had for you, my question, um, Joel, is the fact that you have community and resi. You really cover all the bases. Um, what are your key points? I mean, you gave really all the keys to everything, but right? what are your key points? And again, your goal, same thing as I said to Justin before, and actually all of you, there's the four speakers. If you all want to take your mics off and, and really what are the keys of getting everybody exercising and, and what are the most important things? I mean, look, we all have older parents and, and we're trying to make them exercise and and look, even the Dutch Dementia Village, I remember hearing them talk and it was really their key thing. How, what would I do to get a place for my parents? And I think that's often the driver. But really all of you, now that I have you all with your mics on, what are the keys to success? How you, would you summarise to make this all work in residence, in villages, in communities? Actually, I'll answer that if you like. Um, only because I've... I had to answer it at the Royal Commission because they said, well, you know, why can't other people adopt this model? And everyone can. Everyone can adopt a model of health promotion or a model of exercise, physical and social um, well-being. It can be done. It just requires um, really good design, um, project implementation, and being really committed to it. And you need everyone in the organization committed to making it happen uh, you know i'm extremely lucky because i've got a board and an executive that are very very committed to this model so at a health promotion level that whole of system is fundamental in taking it on anyone else want to add i would say um, in my experience which has been um, almost all of it's been in residential care. It's linking, like you said, linking it to a real life example of how the exercise program might help a person with a personal goal. So if somebody really wants to be able to get in and out of the car or they want to be able to uh, walk for the for their um, grandson's wedding or something like that, it's, it's gold because then you've got the starting point. But even if there's not a particular goal, it's very rare to find people who don't see the benefit in um, being able to walk to and from their meals or get on and off the bus for activities. It, it's really just the way you talk to people about the fact, like Joe said, well, really everybody said this that um, today, that it needs to matter to the person. It's not a, we all know, everybody knows exercise is good, but when you make it person related to the person and their own individual goals, um, I think that's been the key from my experience, to making it really resonate with the, with the individual and, and them being at least prepared to give it a go. And then, of course, once they get there, it needs to be fun. Mm. <laughs> it can't be too serious. <laughs> it needs to be fun. So, And they need to feel that they, they succeeded. You, if you make it too hard on day one, then you lose them straight up. So there's a lot of that too, I think. And Tara, just to add, I think the, the other element which I'll go back and, and call out exercise physiologists again, what we have found in, in that workforce is a very youthful, um, very diverse um, group of, of practitioners um, that are actually uh, really, they enjoy that um, gen intergenerational connection with um, older people but more importantly, older people really thrive on that sort of 
um, relationship, you know, uh, that they can establish with uh, young people that I guess we all strive in the aged care industry um, to, which, you know, continue to attract um, that, uh, that younger cohort and the diversity of, of talent um, to, to be supporting, you know, older people. So um, I think it is, it's upon all of us to, to really be this groundswell movement to sort of be doing more of this. And as great as walking is, it's not the it's not the only answer as as has already been said, and I think that's a bit of my concern coming out of COVID, that people will say, well, I'm I'm walking, I walk, you know, e each day, but it's it's the strength and resistance training, the balance training for those people that are still living, you know, uh, at home or even within residential care. You know, we've got to we've got to keep pushing it back to government, and it's it's great that there has Jenny and Joe have you know had those opportunities with the Royal Commission. Um, directly because we've got to we've got to get you know the mindset changed at all levels. Any final words from Justin? Yeah, that's uh, good. Um, I think um, again some of the things we've mentioned about making it fun. So um, an EP that a few of us know, uh, Rochelle Street in Brisbane, um, small person, big personality, um, does crazy things, dancing, um, is really happy to see herself be silly in some ways with her, her members and clients. So again, making things as fun and enjoyable as, act, as activities as possible. And in some way, so that's the, I suppose, the people side of things. It's really important to get those right people that are, are passionate to work with older adults and see what we might consider as small changes, but can be a massive change for those older clients as really rewarding and the other thing around the facilities again if the facility offers a range of things that older adults are going to benefit from and and come to use regularly so again things like your little cafes like the never 12 program was amazing in how many people would stick around after classes and have little teas and coffees develop a much bigger friendship network than they'd had prior to joining the gym um, those sort of things so again where you put your facility um, that they, particularly if they have to pay to get there, like with a taxi or an Uber, that when they do their gym session, they can have morning tea, they can do the shopping, they could do some other things. So those expenses they'd incur from the exercise program would be incurred anyway, going to that same sort of location. So there are some things to perhaps consider about the facility. Um, and again, places like Ballycar and Bernie Bray are doing great work in that space again that they go into a center they might be there for hours in a day ticking lots of physical and social and and mental benefits for the for the individual so yeah some of my thoughts i suppose yeah i think that really i think we fulfilled the topic of the webinar it was called keys to success and i think we definitely have given you many many keys to success as it is now my duty to wrap up this webinar we've had today so I really, I'm so grateful that all of you um, have joined us. Look, I'm not even gonna mention all the countries, but we're really covering from, from Finland to Spain, to United Arab Emirates, to Japan, to Philippines, to Australia, to South Africa. Like we're really not jokingly covering the whole globe. And we really, I think the speakers, I'm so grateful that you have joined us and shared your wisdom and shared your success stories. Cause I think we need to have the knowledge and, and, and I think we know we need great allied health staff. We need fantastic managers who know, and we need to have joy. I think that's the big thing. We need to have joy. I mean, to have cake, forget about the cake. Um, so, and, and, and we have the knowledge is there and please contact us. Um, I do my best on sharing stuff on our Facebook page and, and all the webinars um, that we have, all the recordings are online, the slides are online, the Q and A's will be online. So our, my purpose here is to share knowledge and try to help you to create something awesome so we can look after everyone and really try to provide everybody, even the frailest, um, the best quality of life. Now with the webinars, the plan is to have one more in December, um, really just to wrap up the year um, as it was, because it hasn't been the easiest. Uh, 2020 really is not perfection as we were hoping, um, but I think, Try to hang in there and, and keep up the joy and 
talk to your friends online on the phone and um we'll keep we'll keep again we'll keep talking and hopefully in december we'll have this this webinar going and thank you again for coming and if you have any questions any comments please let us know and we'll try to answer everything thank you again for coming thank you the speakers and we'll see you soon again thank all you. right bye thank you bye bye, bye.